horror, fantasy, sci-fi, thriller fiction, like magic and invisible chain of sound once more circles the planet. A romance of exciting interest. Chapter 11. The communications to the lover. The heart's despair. Consternation is sympathetic, and anyone who had looked upon the features of Charles Holland now that he was seated with Henry Bannerworth, in expectation of a communication which his fears told him was to blast all his dearest and most fondly cherished hopes forever, would scarce have recognized in him the same young man who, one short hour before, had knocked so loudly and so full of joyful hope and expectation at the door of the hall. But so it was. He knew Henry Bannerworth too well to suppose that any unreal cause could blanch his cheek. He knew Flora too well to imagine for one moment that Caprice had dictated the, to him, fearful words of dismissal she had uttered to him. Happier would it at that time have been for Charles Holland had she acted capriciously towards him and convinced him that his true heart's devotion had been cast at the feet of one unworthy of so really noble a gift. Pride would then have enabled him, no doubt, successfully to resist the blow. A feeling of honest and proper indignation at having his feelings trifled with would, no doubt, have sustained him. But alas, the case seemed widely different. True, she implored him to think of her no more, no longer to cherish in his breast the fond dream of affection which had been its guest so long, but the manner in which she did so brought along with it an irresistible conviction that she was making a noble sacrifice of her own feelings for him, from some cause which was involved in the profoundest mystery. But now he was to hear all, Henry had promised to tell him, and as he looked into his pale but handsomely intellectual face, he half dreaded the disclosure he yet panted to hear. Tell me all, Henry. Tell me all, he said. Upon the words that come from your lips I know I can rely. I will have no reservations with you, said Henry, sadly. You ought to know all, and you shall. Prepare yourself for the strangest revelation you ever heard. Indeed, I. One which in hearing you may well doubt, but one which, I hope, you will never find an opportunity of verifying. You speak in riddles, and yet speak truly, Charles. You heard with what a frantic vehemence Flora desired you to think no more of her? I did. I did. She was right. She is a noble-hearted girl for uttering those words. A dreadful incident in our family has occurred, which might well induce you to pause before uniting your fate with that of any member of it. Impossible. Nothing can possibly subdue the feelings of affection I entertain for Flora. She is worthy of anyone, and as such, amid all changes, all mutations of fortune, she shall be mine. Do not suppose that any change of fortune has produced the scene you were witness to. Then what else? I will tell you, Holland. In all your travels, and all your reading, did you ever come across anything about vampires. About what? cried Charles, drawing his chair forward a little. Uh, uh, about what? You may well doubt the evidence of your own ears, Charles Holland, and wish me to repeat what I said. I say, do you know anything about vampires? Charles Holland looked curiously in Henry's face, and the latter immediately added, I can guess what is passing in your mind at present, and I do not wonder at it. You think I must be mad? Well, really, Henry, your extraordinary question. I knew it. Were I you, I should hesitate to believe the tale. But the fact is, we have every reason to believe that one member of our own family is one of those horrible preternatural beings called vampires. Good God, Henry, can you allow your judgment for a moment to stoop to such a supposition? That is what I have asked myself a hundred times, but, Charles Holland, the judgment, the feelings, and all the prejudices, natural and acquired, must succumb to actual ocular demonstration. Listen to me, and do not interrupt me. You shall know all, and you shall know it circumstantially. 
Henry then related to the astonished Charles Holland all that had occurred from the first alarm of Flora up to that period when he, Holland, caught her in his arms as she was about to leave the room. And now, he said in conclusion, I cannot tell what opinion you may come to as regards these most singular events. You will recollect that here is the unbiased evidence of four or five people to the facts, and beyond that, the servants who have seen something of the horrible visitor. You bewilder me utterly, said Charles Holland, as we are all bewildered. But, but, gracious heaven, it cannot be. It is. No. No. There is... There must be some dreadful mistake. Can you start any supposition by which we can otherwise explain the phenomena I have described to you? If you can, for heaven's sake, do so, and you will find no one who will cling to it with more tenacity than I. Any other species or kind of supernatural appearance might admit of argument, but this, to my perception, is too wildly improbable, too much at variance with all we see and know of the operations of nature. It is so. All that we have told ourselves, repeatedly, and yet is all human reason at once struck down by the few brief words of, We have seen it. I would doubt my eyesight. One might, but many cannot be laboring under the same delusion. My friend, I pray you, do not make me shudder at the supposition that such a dreadful thing as this is at all possible. I am, believe me, Charles, most unwilling to oppress anyone with the knowledge of these evils. But you are so situated with us that you ought to know. And you will clearly understand that you may, with perfect honor, now consider yourself free from all engagements you have entered into with Flora. No. No. No! By heaven, no! Yes, Charles. Reflect upon the consequences now of a union with such a family. Oh, Henry Bannerworth, can you suppose me so dead to all good feeling, so utterly lost to honorable impulses as to eject from my heart her who has possession of it entirely on such a ground as this? You would be justified, coldly justified in prudence, I might be. There are a thousand circumstances in which a man may be justified in a particular course of action, and that course yet may be neither honorable nor just. I love Flora. Were she tormented by the whole of the supernatural world, I should still love her. Nay, it becomes then a higher and a nobler duty on my part to stand between her and those evils, if possible. Charles, Charles, said Henry, I cannot, of course, refuse you my meat of praise and admiration for your generosity of feeling. But remember, if we are compelled, despite all our feelings and all our predilections to the contrary, to give in to a belief in the existence of vampires, why may we not at once receive as the truth all that is recorded of them? To what do you allude? To this that one who has been visited by a vampire and whose blood has formed a horrible repast for such a being becomes, after death, one of the dreadful race and visits others in the same way. Now this must be insanity, cried Charles. It bears the aspect of it indeed, said Henry. Oh, that you could by some means satisfy yourself that I am mad. There may be insanity in this family, thought Charles with such an exquisite pang of misery that he groaned aloud. Already, added Henry mournfully, already the blighting influence of the dreadful tale is upon you, Charles. Oh, let me add my advice to Flora's entreaties. She loves you, and we all esteem you. Fly then from us, and leave us to encounter our miseries alone. Fly from us, Charles Holland, and take with you our best wishes for happiness which you cannot know here. Never! cried Charles. I devote my existence to Flora. I will not play the coward and fly from one whom I love on such grounds. I devote my life to her. Henry could not speak for emotion for several minutes, and when at length, in a faltering voice, he could utter some words, he said, God of heaven! What happiness is marred by these horrible events? What have we all done to be the victims of such a dreadful act of vengeance? Henry, 
Do not talk in that way, cried Charles. Rather, let us blend our energies to overcoming the evil than spend any time in useless lamentations. I cannot even yet give in to a belief in the existence of such a being as you say visited Flora. But the evidences! Look you here, Henry. Until I am convinced that some things have happened which it is totally impossible could happen by any human means whatever, I will not ascribe them to supernatural influence. But what human means, Charles, could produce what I have now narrated to you? Hmm. I do not know just at present, but I will give the subject the most attentive consideration. Will you not accommodate me here for a time? You know you are welcome here as if the house were your own and all that it contains. I believe so, most truly. You have no objection, I presume, to my conversing with Flora upon this strange subject? Certainly not. Of course, you will be careful to say nothing which can add to her fears. I shall be most guarded, believe me. You say your brother George, Mr. Chillingworth, yourself, and this uh, Mr. Marchdale have all been cognizant of the circumstances? Yes, yes. Then with the whole of them, you permit me to hold free communion upon the subject? Most certainly. I will do so, then. Keep up good heart, Henry, and this affair, which looks so full of terror at first sight, may yet be divested of some of its hideous aspect. I am rejoiced, if anything can rejoice me now, said Henry, to see you view the subject with so much philosophy. Why, said Charles, you made a remark of your own which enabled me, viewing the matter at its very worst and most hideous aspect, to gather hope. What was that? You said, properly and naturally enough, that if ever we felt that there was such a weight of evidence in favor of a belief in the existence of vampires that we are compelled to succumb to it, we might as well receive all the popular feelings and superstitions concerning them likewise. I did. Where is the bind to pause when once we open it to the reception of such things? Well then, if that be the case, we will watch this vampire and catch it catch it? Yes, surely it can be caught. As I understand, this species of being is not like an apparition that may be composed of thin air and utterly impalpable to the human touch, but it consists of a revivified corpse. Yes, yes. Then it is tangible and destructible. By heaven, if ever I catch a glimpse of any such thing, it shall drag me to its home, be that where it may, or I will make it prisoner. Oh, Charles, you know not the feeling of horror that will come across you when you do. You have no idea of how the warm blood will seem to curdle in your veins, and how you will be paralyzed in every limb. Hmm. Did you feel so? I did. Hmm. I will endeavor to make head against such feelings. The love of Flora shall enable me to vanquish them. Think you it will come again tomorrow? I can have no thought the one way or the other. It may. We must arrange among us all, Henry, some plan of watching which, without completely prostrating our health and strength, will always provide that one shall be up all night and on the alert. It must be done. Flora ought to sleep with the consciousness now that she has ever at hand some intrepid and well-armed protector who is not only himself prepared to defend her, but who can in a moment give an alarm to us all in case of necessity requiring it. It would be a dreadful capture to make to seize a vampire, said Henry. Not at all. It would be a very desirable one. Being a corpse revivified, it is capable of complete destruction, so as to render it no longer a scourge to anyone. Charles, are you jesting with me, or do you really give any credence to the story? My dear friend, I always make it a rule to take things at their worst, and then I cannot be disappointed. I am content to reason upon this matter as if the fact of the existence of a vampire were thoroughly established, and then to think upon what is best to be done about it. You are right. If it should turn out then that there is an error in the fact, well and good, we are all the better off. But if otherwise, we are prepared and armed at all points. Be it so then. It strikes me, Charles, that you will be the coolest and the calmest among us on this emergency. Ah, uh, but the hour now waxes late. I will get them to prepare a chamber for you, and at least tonight, after what has occurred already, I should think we can be under no apprehension. 
Probably not. But, Henry, if you would, allow me to sleep in that room where the portrait hangs of him whom you suppose to be the vampire. I should prefer it. Prefer it? Yes. I am not one who courts danger for danger's sake, but I would rather occupy that room to see if the vampire, who perhaps has a partiality for it, will pay me a visit. As you please, Charles. You can have the apartment. It is in the same state as when occupied by Flora. Nothing has been, I believe, removed from it. You will let me, then, while I remain here, call it my room? Assuredly. This arrangement was accordingly made, to the surprise of all the household, not one of whom would indeed have slept or attempted to sleep there for any amount of reward. But Charles Holland had his own reasons for preferring that chamber, and he was conducted to it in the course of half an hour by Henry, who looked around it with a shudder as he bade his young friend good night. Varney, the Vampire, or the Feast of Blood, Chapter 11. Narrated by Edward E. French. Copyright exists on all recordings issued by Edward E. French. Any unauthorized broadcasting, public performance, copying, or re-recording of these audiobooks in any manner whatsoever will constitute an infringement of such copyright. Editing, alteration, copying, or redistribution inconsistent with copyright laws is prohibited, whether by digital, electronic, or other means. Links may be used, provided that full and clear credit is given to Edward E. French with appropriate and specific direction to the original content. Direct inquiries regarding this recording to Edward E. French at email edwardfrench 6 at hotmail.com. Subscribe to the Fiction Fantastic channel www.youtube.com forward slash French Edward 06.